Welcome back, movie lover badasses. Today, we are going to review The Man from UNCLE. Here's a quick plot synopsis. During the Cold War, an American spy must team up with a Russian spy for the greater good of both countries when a nuclear threat emerges. Now we're going to give you the good, I'm going to give you the bad. And no, we didn't forget badass. There's no badass. It's not bad, just no badass. First up, the good. So this show is based on a 60s TV series that ran for about four seasons. Uh, my mom was a huge fan of the show. Uh, she loved it when she was a little girl. And uh, so I knew about it a, a little bit here and there, and I've actually recently started watching a couple more episodes. I saw a few episodes several years ago, and I was surprised by how much fun it was. I have a, I have a, a soft spot for 60s TV shows for some reason. It's probably because of my mom. And it's... It's fun. It's a perfect of its era series. And the movie does a pretty good job capturing it being in the 60s. My mom came to see it with us and uh, she she said while it didn't make her be nostalgic for the series, she didn't feel like there was a true connection to the series, probably because it's a Guy Ritchie movie, why would she? She did say that she was glad that it felt like it was set in the 60s. She was afraid it was going to be a modern retelling, which I don't really think that's necessary. The Man from U.N.C.L.E. It is a product of the 60s. And some people have had an issue with not being able to relate to the problems in the 60s, be it the Cold War and the Russian spy, the KGB versus the CIA. But I, I found it endearing. I really enjoyed the chemistry between uh, Ilya Kiryakin's character and uh, Napoleon Solo's character. I thought the two actors did a really good job playing their respective roles. I felt like Henry Cavill uh, did a pretty good, his own interpretation of Solo's character. Kind of hearkening back a little bit to Robert Vaughn's portrayal, whereas Army Hammer, he was okay. You know, they they did try to keep one aspect of uh, Kiryakin's character from the TV series in that he was kind of the Spock because he was this mysterious Russian agent all the women were like, I'm going to fix this guy. I'm going to make this guy the emotional dream that I want. And they kind of made him, they did a really interesting juxtaposition with his character in this film that I don't believe they would have tapped on in the 60s in that, yes, he was very cold and he was very, in some ways, emotionless. But at the same time, he was a freaking psychopath. He had serious anger management issues and he had a lot of deep-rooted um uh, uh, mommy and daddy issues. Uh, his dad got sent off to the gulags. His mom kind of became a, a woman of the night, you might say. She was acquainted with many, many gentleman callers. And uh, any mention of, any ill mentioning of his parents sent him into this. He had this tick where he would like start tapping his fingers and all of a sudden he, he, <laughs> he, he could go into a, just a blind rage and so I thought that was really interesting that they kind of brought that to his character while making him uh, kind of cold so that was I thought that was a pretty interesting portrayal this is almost like an origin story because as far as I know uh, the series jumps right in to uh, the characters already having been established with each other they're already part of uncle in the TV show we do not get any mention of actual the uncle organization even though they call it a code name by the end of the film, which is a little strange. It is an organization in the TV series. And uh, so we don't get any of that until the very end. But I thought the chemistry was there. Uh, I'm really interested in seeing a sequel. I kind of feel mm -hmm. like this could be another Sherlock Holmes, where I enjoyed the first one, but I really, really enjoyed the second one because we had more elements. Everybody had already been established. We had our origin out of the way. Right. Now we have the nemesis, which is Moriarty. I would love to see the Uncle Crew go up against Thrush, which is their specter, if you would. And speaking about Guy Ritchie's uh, interpretation of the Sherlock Holmes character in his two films, I think he was the perfect choice to direct this type of film with that 60s mm. vibe and setting. I mean, Henry Cavill, <laughs> if there was any doubt if Henry Cavill could be James Bond in future, you know, James Bond interpretations after Daniel Craig is done. I think we're in good hands because he was great in his movie. He won't. He's Superman. He's Superman, but he, oh come on. He would. He would make. He's he's really good looking. I feel like he's finally pulled out of that Immortals 
where nobody stood a chance in hell of, of salvaging any of their roles in that movie, even though the action towards the end was really good. Um, and even in Superman, you know, he was he had to be an alien, so, you know, he was a little, a little stiff, but I feel like by the time we get Batman vs. Superman, he's going to be fine. I feel like this really showcased his charisma, mm -hmm. uh, which I hadn't really felt before. I didn't have any problem with him being Superman. I liked his portrayal of Superman, but I feel like this is the one where I was like, okay, he's he can be characters now. Yeah. I get it. He's cool. Another highlight of the film, which we enjoyed, was there's definitely some good comedic moments, <laughs> especially between uh, Cavill and uh, Army Hammer, and some fairly decent action spread throughout the film. And the soundtrack is definitely one of the big highlights for me mm -hmm. uh, in this movie. The soundtrack has had this really cool, uh, funky, uh, 60s retro vibe to it. You know, I was in the theater like... <laughs> I did. It was getting down, but yeah, it was cool. The soundtrack was great, and it had this very interesting. Um, it had this very interesting switch that it did towards the end, uh, where there's this um, montage of uh, them invading. It's the big finale, and they're going after the bad guys. I'll just put it that way. And the the soundtrack goes to this really crazy rhythmic drum beat. And it, it stays with you for about two to three mm -hmm. minutes, and it was really like, yeah, kind of getting you. Kind of right like a there. jazzy, like a jazzy drum beat. Without any, uh, without any um, uh, music to it, it was just beat. It was just drum beat. It really, really intense drum beat. Another thing that was really interesting is that, and it makes sense because of the Morricone movies being a lot of them <laughs> with the with the Leone movies being in the '60s. But we went straight up Morricone in this soundtrack, and especially it was it was more for um, Kiriakin's theme. It seemed like whenever he was <laughs> he was there, all of a sudden this bizarre '60s dang <laughs> Once Upon a Time in the West thing. I really enjoyed it though. It yeah. was it was some good stuff. Every time they showed his eyes, like he was really getting pissed off inside, they had the camera zoom in, pull up on his eyes, yeah. and they would play Morricone's you know similar theme. Yeah, it wasn't Morricone, but. It was yeah. very, it was very much an homage. The bell, boom, like, dang. Yeah, it was very <laughs> bizarre, but it fit. It fit really well. Definitely going to have to buy the soundtrack on this. And now for the bad. I don't really see a lot of people, unfortunately, liking this movie as much as you would say Mission Impossible Rogue Nation uh, experience, because it's not necessarily a too bad of a thing for this film, but this is definitely a smaller, lower key spy espionage adventure. There really isn't that much action which might turn people away, I think, that are expecting a lot of action, okay? Yeah. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation is looking like freaking Mad Max Fury Road in comparison. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's looking like because it's very quiet, you know, a few gunshots here and there, uh, a little bit of fight choreography here and there, but it's more story driven. The story is stock. The story's not necessarily anything amazing. The villain in the film, she was a good actress, uh, but she was kind of stock too. It just anybody could have really played that part. She didn't really stand out, and uh, sometimes the tone would be a little bit off because we have this, you know, comedic, funny moments, and then all of a sudden it's serious, and it's just kind of okay. And nothing too too distracting. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that could have been either uh, an editing thing where they just didn't have. Uh, or could have been a director's choice. We'll, we'll never really know. I didn't find it too, too distracting. No. The most I found distracting was the very beginning. There is a, a scene where uh, Cavill was talking to this guy who's his boss. And in the very next scene, we're in a different location, but he's talking to his boss again. It's like, wait, why don't we just jump? Wait, okay. Oh, we're, we're with, they've met up. Kiriakin and Solo, they've met up. And oh, they're working together. Oh, okay. Okay, we're done. <laughs> we're in. We're in the movie, folks. Jump in. <laughs> It's fine. It's warm. Come on. <laughs> uh, so I mean, but it wasn't. It wasn't too distracting. No. Um, I felt like the movie. You know, sometimes I feel like period pieces might be a detriment to themselves because some people won't like uh, a different tone, even though it worked really good for X Men: First Class and X Men: Days of Future Past, which is set in the '60s and the '70s, respectively. I I know the the spy genre is really making a comeback this year. I know. Uh, so. Some people might be okay with the 60s vibe because it, it does capture the 60s atmosphere really well. I felt like it. Uh, you, 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 you feel like you're in the 60s, but without it being completely exaggerated, you don't really see go-go dancers and you don't see 
It's not Austin Powers level, okay? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not psychedelic or anything like that. You see a couple of fashion choices that are like, hi, 60s! But I like stuff like that. I, I like being kind of taken to another time period. So Army Hammer, who is basically considered uh, box office poison after the horrible flop that was Lone Ranger, he's kind of in Taylor Kitsch status, what Taylor Kitsch kind of used to be. Uh, <laughs> John Carter status. Um, he's kind of has that stigma over him, but I actually was fine with him in this film. I mean, his Russian accent was wasn't terrible. Yeah. It wasn't great. It was. It was a. It was a. It was, it was in the an middle. American uh, affecting a Russian accent. Yeah. I feel. I feel like I've never seen Army Hammer in anything. I ever saw a Lone Ranger. I wasn't about to go there. I've never seen him that I can remember. I've never seen him in anything. But I know his reputation at this point, and I, I feel like there is a good character actor in there somewhere. It's in there somewhere. He had <laughs> moments in this film where I was actually feeling for him and his character and his background story. So I, I can't say he blew me away in this, but I, there is something in there. And I'm really interested in seeing the day or the role when he is really able to shine. And who knows, maybe the sequel will uh, crank something out where him and Cavill are even better than they were in this version and they really start to gel and you're like, I want to see another solo and Kuriakin movie. So overall, we recommend the film. It's a definitely a good time if you want to go see it in theater. Just remember, going in, do not expect Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Okay, quieter, smaller, lower scale, but yet still fun film. So we give The Man From U.N.C.L.E. 3.7 out of 5 Ninja Stars. <laughs> if you thought this movie was fun, if you really loved it, or if you hated it, if you, man, this is a disgrace to the TV series, let us know. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like, share, and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time. Are we spies yet? Ha <laughs> ha